Good afternoon, good morning, or good evening, wherever you are in the world. Our topic today, I find it very interesting, and that is reading between the lines or interpreting the hidden meanings of what people say, a valuable skill. They'll help you navigate your daily life. While you may not always be able to figure out exactly what someone might have meant, you can get a good idea, which is half of the battle. For this topic, we have, like I said, a special guest all the way from Mexico, which I will pass the torch to my colleague, Maria, to introduce her. Good afternoon, Maria. The floor is yours. Oh, thank you, my dear Mona. Well, I have the pleasure of introducing my good friend and colleague for the past at least 20 years. Well, we shouldn't be saying that, right? I know. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm very, I'm very happy and proud to introduce Liliana Cantu. She has been a trainer, coach, and facilitator in all things intercultural for the past over 20 years. She is actually the founding president of CTAR Mexico. Now, CTAR, for those who don't know, is the Society for Intercultural Education, Training, and Research, a very important organ that helps interculturalists connect with each other and move forward in the whole science of interculturalism. And she has been pivotal in working with many different companies in all different industries across different ranges, especially in helping expats, helping companies, global companies understand how to do business in Mexico and vice versa. So it is my pleasure to introduce you, Liliana. And as we start out, I think that the whole theme of reading between the lines is one that's fascinating. Mm -hmm. As someone who had to learn how to live and speak in Mexico, I know that I made a bunch of mistakes <laughs> starting mm -hmm. out. And one of the things that many expats, many executives, many people who work and live in Mexico say is, I don't really understand what people mean when they say ahorita or mañana, mm -hmm. tomorrow mm -hmm. or now, now in a little bit. Is it a little bit or is it never? <laughs> so, I want to start talking about what that actually means. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Mona. Uh, thanks for the invitation. I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled to, to be a guest in your program and to be talking about this topic because I, I do think that it's the topic or one of the main issues that cause intercultural misunderstandings and that don't allow teams or colleagues to really, really understand each other and work well together. It all has to do with, with priorities and, and what's important to each one as in anything with intercultural interactions. If you understand the other side, you know, and, and you're assuming difference. I love that phrase of if you're going to assume anything, assume difference. Don't take anything for granted, particularly with communication. I think you're in a good place to start finding those converging paths. Ahorita. <laughs> uh, the thing is, and I think here, thank you for starting there because it uh, it's a point that I always made. Don't pay attention to the word <laughs> because ahorita... You know, exactly, it can have many meanings. What's, what else? What's the situation? What's the relationship between, you know, you and that person? We often talk about, you know, the difference between direct and indirect communication. I like uh, using Edward T. Hall's uh, dimension on uh, better on context, because it's not only the words, high context communication, like Mexico, the message is not only in the words. It's in everything else. <laughs> it's not only what I say, it's how I say it, the tone of voice, the facial expression, uh, and also the situational context. You know, what happened before, what can happen depending on the, on the situation, and that can give a different meaning to that, to that ahorita. I remember training a group of Mexican couples that they were uh, moving to uh, North Carolina, and we're talking about the ahorita, and I remember one of the spouses saying, well, it's, it's different if you say, Ahorita or ahorita. <laughs> so just the nonverbal, you know, it's part of that context, that other channel that you pay attention to that and you add up all that context, you get the right meaning. 
the meaning is there because of course from the more direct low context perspective it feels like the person is not being clear doesn't want to really make a, a, a the message doesn't really want to tell you something or is hiding something and uh it's because you're missing you know so many cha uh, channels channels where you complete that message and, and and you get the right the right meaning of the ahorita and that was a really high context answer giving a lot of explanation rather than just saying ahorita means this or that right so the ahorita it depends on who comes who it comes from i know if it comes from my 20 year old daughter that means pretty much never <laughs> But if it's from my colleague, even Mexican colleague, still, if I want more clarity, ask for more clarity. Uh, oh, can it be before 5 p.m.? And then I have a better idea. Uh, I had a, um, one of my clients had said to me, when my colleague in Mexico says, ahorita, which literally means in a bit now, a bit. but little, a little now, uh -huh. but you don't know if it means right now or it means in a little while. And that's why it's so, but she said to me, I don't know when somebody says ahorita, if I have time to run to the bathroom or not. <laughs> and I'm like, you have time to run to the bathroom. <laughs> Plenty or you can time. ask, right? Or you can <laughs> ask and say, can I just run to the bathroom? And you know, uh, but yeah. I just thought that was so funny. I was well, training a couple from Sweden, no, Denmark. And she had it very simple. It's like, if it's not clear, ask for probably for clarification, right? It's so, but I, I guess it's this feeling of this person doesn't want to be clear with me rather than that's more open <laughs> a perspective to communication where if I need a little more specificity, <laughs> uh, that person to be more specific, you can just, you know, ask. Okay, so, so ahorita means like 3 p.m.? <laughs> And then there's also the, the concern of, of being too direct, right? Mm -hmm. Because for instance, that ahorita like 2 p.m., it would be different if I say ahorita like 2 p.m. or ahorita like 2 p.m. <laughs> you know, it's just that, of course, I exaggerated a little bit, right? But just that uh, a nonverbal communication or the, the, the tone of voice, the facial expression is through the context, through the high context, sending the message, keeping it very direct. You know, it's still a direct message, that question, but through the context, you're making it, at least for Mexico, culturally appropriate because you're sending in that channel, this message of, I don't want to, you know, pressure you. Uh, I care about your relationship. I don't want to, I don't want to sound too, you know, harsh, but I really need to know if this is going to be 2 PM. Right. Uh, so I always say that the context, rather than being like a difference, it can also be a tool to mm. make your direct messages and your direct communication more culturally appropriate. I use it all the time here in Mexico. I think that mm. in, like in cultural profiles, I always come up as more direct, but I'm really high context. So I know I can be very specific in when I, when I am asking, but with the nonverbals, with the posture, with the maybe like, uh, maybe making a little small introduction to my very mm -hmm. specific and direct request just to uh, ease in and, and, and still be direct in the, in the request. It can be a tool to, you know, bridge those communication gaps. I don't know what, what worked for you uh, here in Mexico when you were trying to like <laughs> get, get adapted to the communication. One thing that I'm listening to you, Liliana, and I, I understand exactly what you're saying is basically do not rock the boat. It's just do do whatever you can, you got to do. Just don't rock the boat. Just make sure you say face one of those two criterias. And I grew up in a high context society still is today. And it always drove me crazy because I asked, I said, okay, well, if you're masking what you truly believe or feel. How can I pick that up? But I realized that we can start work as a skill, just like any other that we can work on. And through practice, we can start picking that up very fast. But the question is, when we are able to see the person, we can sense and feel the body language, the tone, the eye contact, all that. It's quite easier than in written words. Because when you are sending a message, whether it through email or text, it can be crucial how it comes through. 
So to me, every time I am writing something, I am much, much more conscious of what is it that I write, the word that I'm using, and how am I sending it, and possibly if there are emojis attached to that communication. What would you say about that? The writing, the written version of nonverbal communication and the face-to-face. I agree completely. I mean, you're, you're more able to use all these contexts when you're face to face and all of that is pretty much gone Mm -hmm. unless you find ways to still incorporate it. Right. You were mentioning right now, the emojis, what's the, in this case, Mexican, right. Or Latin American priority is I want to know that our relationship is okay. That there's no, that, that there's harmony that we like each other. That, so what can send that message? Maybe a, a brief but greeting uh, at the beginning, right? So hi, and I hope you had a, a nice uh, weekend. Or if there was something that I told you last time, hi, and I hope that your daughter uh, started her a trip that you told me about. Uh, great, right? Or something like that. That it's like boop, checking the check mark, right? Of okay, good, we're we're connected. And then very often with with uh, the cultural differences, we we tend to go very black and white. Oh, these are direct, these are indirect. But really, within a country, there's gonna be more direct or more indirect people. And even the same person, I know I'm more direct with some people, and I try to soften things and be more gentle with other people, depending on what exactly, on the context, on the relationship, on what the situation, et cetera, on the trust, to not just put in black and white, not this is person, this person is, is indirect, it's high context. So I have to, you know, you can, you can combine. I mean, you start with the, okay, the relationship check mark, and then go uh, direct because there's even, uh, again, also differences even within a country, right? I'm from Monterrey. We're supposed to, or at least generally perceived to be a little more direct and honest and to the point. So maybe someone from another country in an effort to be, you know, culturally appropriate will be being, uh, will be too indirect. And I might be like, just ask me, (laughs) you know, no problem. So I would say like, also, I don't know if the word is gouge, like feel uh, a... It, thank you. <laughs> Even from, from individual to individual, make having these little like strategies or measures. I've had participants say, I always make sure I start my uh, email with a greeting, make sure I say goodbye in a nice way. And then you can also, you know, get to agreements because closing the cultural gap doesn't necessarily always mean you coming closer to the other side. You can also make suggestions to the other side because there's going to be a positive outcome for both, right? You know, for me to uh, get a better understanding of what you're asking in an email, it would be great if you use bullets, for instance. That's a tip I always share, you mm-hmm. know, because somehow <laughs> when we learn to use PowerPoint and we learn that each bullet has a ha- had to have an idea. So I think that's, a, that's a, a strategy that helps more indirect, high context people ground the ideas. That reminds me, Liliana, what you just said. I remember working with two teams. One was in the U.S. and the other in Mexico. And somebody in the American team said, you know, I find it very strange when I'm having a conversation via Teams chat that my Mexican colleagues will say, hi, Joe, how are you? And leave it at that. And they're like, fine, what do you want? You know, and so they were they would be like frustrated and perplexed that why would their Mexican colleagues just say, hi, how are you? And wait until the American would answer before making their request. request. Mm-hmm. And, and so one of the things is remember that it's relationship versus task. So would you like to talk a little bit about why that happens that the Mexicans don't jump right in before, you know, and just wait? I was get- listening to you and I thought, well, why wouldn't I start? For me, it will feel rude. Hi, how are you? Can you send me? Wait, so you're not really interested in how I am. (laughs) You just want something, right? So don't even ask, (laughs) you know? So, but that's, again, the relationship oriented. This is more important for me. So it's that, okay, how are you? 
I'm sending the message. I'm first, I'm interested in you. Fine, thank you. Uh, how are you? Fine, thank you. Say, can you send me? <laughs> you know, it's, and it's just like sometimes even the, the natural flow of things. Somebody was telling me, someone from the US was like, why do Mexicans always say sorry? Don't say sorry. <laughs> but because he's like, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, uh, sorry, can you, you know, and it's just like automatic. I don't think that we say in Spanish, but, you know, it's just these things that you learn. And, and, yeah, exactly. I remember a German uh, participant once saying, our way to ask uh, or to make requests, because requests can have this risk of sound, sounding too demanding, they, they will be, they, they will have this style. And this person was, was saying, well, my Mexican colleague may, asks me things like, oh, I'm sorry, could you please send me uh, the report from, and he was even upset. He was like, why does he ask it like, like that? It's like, as if I had the, the option to say, no, no, I don't have, I don't want to send you that, <laughs> right? It's my job. Of course I have to send it. So he doesn't need to be so, excuse me, could I ask you for the favor of you sending me, just ask for the thing, right? But for, for the Mexican side, it's like, it's the correct way to ask for something. Because if I just contact you and say, uh, can you please say, it's from being used to an environment where your priority and the first thing you're, you're paying attention to is feelings and not offending and saving face, as Mona was saying, that would sound too harsh. So it's again, not assuming really. And, and keeping in mind what you know about the other culture. I always tell Mexicans talking about communication, talking about behaviors in individualism versus collectivism, keep in mind this phrase in your head. It's not personal. It's not personal. You know, they, they just need that report. If they're not upset at you, they, there's no problem. There's, you know, it's just, it's not personal. And to have those, I think, tips or mottos or slogans, uh, mantras, right? To keep in mind that your perception of behaviors will always be influenced by your culture and, and you need to be paying attention, constant attention of, uh, on that. This is why, I mean, I'm listening to, <laughs> to you too. And I'm thinking, I said, well, this is why it's so important. The job that we do or the work we do is extremely important because I remember attending a webinar of Simone Schneck. Is that what? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. He's well known. And one thing that he mentioned about this, and I think is a matter of disclosing our ways of doing business or communication, whatever, ahead of time to avoid any type of misunderstanding. And he said, okay, if you want to send a message to someone, just be clear and direct right at the get-go. Because if you just say, hi, how are you? I hope you're doing well. I was wondering if a, he said this just so hypocritical. Just say, hi, this is so so. I'm contacting you because blah, blah, blah. This is what I'm contacting you. And at the end, I hope you're doing well. Let me know if the. So again, these are two different approaches from two different environments with two different ways. And knowing ahead of time what we are entering into would be so much helpful. And this is when dialogue and communication come, come handy. For sure. But here's the thing, and I'm going to throw in my little two cents. The thing is, everything is coming from a different perspective and, call, and, and filter, right? So for what one person is annoying and hypocritical, for another person, it might be an essential part of courteous protocol. Mm -hmm. And for what my American client was annoying and frustrating to have to wait again he's he's prioritizing the task and the time and he's like don't make me waste time answering you and saying i'm fine how are you I just get to whatever the heck you need mm -hmm. <laughs> whereas another person's like wait a minute how do you and here comes the trust thing how do you develop trust i need to get to know you and see what kind of person you are before i trust you the other guy's like hey i just need for you to get things done and know that you're competent so that I can trust you. And that was a real eye opener for these two groups. Let me tell you mm -hmm. yeah. so that yes, when they walked away, they're like, Oh, I get it. That's why I've been having problems here. Mm -hmm. And like you said, Liliana, it's not personal. 
It's yes. this is this is the way your mom and dad taught you how to interact with others, and this is what your society has given you as reinforcement. And guess what? Now we have to figure out how other people do it so we don't, you know, trip all over each other. So exactly. Because you, you make a really important point because you one would think, well, but these people are different. This has a one style, the other one has a other style, each one evaluates the behavior of the other from their style. But you've touched on, on something important. What's important for both of them? Trust. Mm -hmm. And we always want the other person to trust us. That's another thing I always tell in programs. Is the thing is that we might be trying to develop trust in a way that we're just like completely off. So that's the value of trying to, to of learning about you know what motivates the other, what what does trust mean for the other. Because it can be very, very simple and automatic and implicit to, oh, you develop trust, you try to get to know the person, and that so that person trusts you. Relationship-oriented cultures, <laughs> task-oriented cultures, it's through the competence, is through saying what you're going to do, delivering accountability, and, and that develops the trust that will allow then, because I always say, of course, you can develop personal relationships in task-oriented cultures, but it's not the focus and it's not the, the priority and it's not the main point for trust and same the other way around. Right. Of course, right now that, um, Mona was talking about, you know, what if you, you are direct, <laughs> you know, you cannot become indirect. And it's part of the same thing. I, I always say, well, it, what do I do if I know I'm not going to be able to come close to the other cultural style? Maybe I, I, I even if I tried, I cannot become indirect and in high context. I think that then it's the strategies should be, how do I buffer that characteristic that not, I know that it's very different from my colleague and that I know that I can not change. And then you can also develop many strategies, kind of like what Mona was saying, right? Like agreeing or disclosing. I always make the suggestion, if you know that you're be perceived as, as harsh, you're wreck, et cetera, and you know, you can't become indirect, you can start your conversations, pointing that out, you know, say, I tend to be very direct. I don't want you to think that I'm upset. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's just to, for us to, you know, be better at what we're doing. Uh, so, but I just, I really wanted to let you know in case it's something very different from what you're used to. <laughs> I, I call that the disclaimer method and it really works because it even, if, even if nobody comes up and says, Hey, remember that time you said that you might be a little rude inadvertently because you're more direct, they won't say it, but they'll remember it and they won't take it personally. That's why that's, it's a good idea to have that meta talk, talk about how you're going to talk from the very yeah. beginning. Yeah. Exactly. Establish the expectations and it, and people are able to see beyond you know, the, the, the very personal, yes. um, you know, that, that reaction, that trigger that it might have, you're mm -hmm. like, Oh, okay. That's irritating. But I realized that they didn't do it on purpose. Uh -huh. <laughs> that's, yeah. just, that's just the way they, they are. So, okay. So I'm fine. Yeah. That's a great, well, great method. This kind, whatever we are talking about, and that is a uh, reading between the line and asking question, disclosure, disclaimers, whatever we want to call them. I mean, if you think about it, if you sit and think about it, it's, it's a very, very important skill that is not taught to many people. And it's just so vital, especially in today's globalized world, especially if you are trying to tell if someone is being truthful, if they have your best interests at heart, if they really understand what you are telling them. If you are listening intently, I mean, there's so many, so many things involved. What elements should we look for when we try to read between the line? Because like I said, it is specialized skill that needs to be taught because sometimes we're just, we talk about it randomly and openly and we say, okay, reading between the line, but it's so difficult because you might fall into false assumptions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what are the elements that we need to be aware of? Yeah, I agree that it can be a, a skill <laughs> that is not easy to develop from one moment to the other, but very practical tips like do not ask questions that can be answered with a yes or a no, <laughs> mm. because you'll probably get a yes with the words. And if it's a no total, meaning with the context, you realize, ah, mm, no, he's, he hesitated, the tone of voice and yeah. before he did this and I'm his boss, so maybe he's, you know, 
doesn't want to lose weight, whatever, you're, you're going to miss that, right? So if you don't allow that to happen, you know, don't ask questions that can be answered with a yes or a no, because you probably get a yes, even if it's a no, have the other person elaborate, especially when it's, when there's something that has the risk for the other person to lose face. Like, did you understand? Did you understand? Of course, they're going to answer yes, because if they answer no, it's like, I'm saying I'm dumb. <laughs> I didn't mm -hmm. get it, right? And, uh, and it's so interesting how all of these things interwind. It's not only communication isolated. You know, we're already seeing how communication interwines with, do we focus on the relationship or the task? It interwines with, are we individualistic or collectivistic and we're caring for the harmony? But it also mm -hmm. interwines with, Yes, the, 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 the saving face is part of that. But I always point out also, what have we learned in each of our countries about making mistakes mm. or saying the wrong thing or asking a, a very basic question? And even there, there's differences because I love to ask a question in the US. What do you learn here since your children at home at school? Is it okay to make mistakes? Yes. Of course, because it's a country that was born in risk <laughs> orientation. Let's go to the unknown and risk it everything. And of course you're going to make mistakes, but it's worth it, right? Because you're mm. going to be the first one getting the whatever. Very different from risk avoidant or certainty oriented or however you want to call it. Culture, particularly in Mexico, where if you look at our educational system and collectivism on top of that, don't want to look, look bad, uh, be the dumb one, right? You don't learn that. You don't learn it's okay to make mistakes. It's a pretty phrase, but in reality, you don't want to make mistakes. Again, if you make a mistake, you're probably going to be, you know, a lectured or there's going to be a consequence. And plus you, you look bad again, you lose face that in past communication where in any situation where, for instance, that question, right? Did you understand? Well, I'm not going to say no, right? Because then I'm, I'm wrong. I'm dumb, whatever. Right. So maybe that would be another important tip always pay attention to the face issue of the person the dignity the how are they projecting you know and if there's risk then you have to maybe make make uh, adjustments interpret accordingly not only your the messages that you're giving but also when you're listening to someone and they're very high context check maybe if the situation is one where that person is at risk of losing face you mentioned, you alluded a little bit to history, and I always say it's very important to know a little bit of the historical background of different countries, because that's basically like a person's experience, and they tell you a little bit what their behavior is like. And you talked about the pioneering spirit of Americans that are more accepting of risk. Do you think that also in Mexico, I mean, I'm thinking about changes that occurred in Mexican history, starting with conquest and then... Um, you know, losing half the territory, invasions by the French, the revolution. Do you think that that kind of is part of what determines the culture in behaviors, maybe avoiding risk or following certain norms? Definitely. I think I always say that and I agree with you. I mean, what has history taught us? What, what has change brought us? <laughs> the change in our history has always been pretty dramatic. I think that definitely influences how we see uh, uh, change. Plus, we are a culture that where people are socialized to value a lot tradition and the way we've always done things. And, and put, put on, on top of that uh, a fear of change or making mistake that things will be very different from one culture to the other. Uh, and I always also share that I think that the, the indirectness in Mexican communication has this two sources. One is definitely the cultural part, the being collectivistic, caring for the relationship. So then, especially when there's hard news, you know, communication can become very indirect, but also on, and I mentioned like the, the, uh, what we learned, educational system, even the skills, the communication skills that we develop or not in our educational years impact. Sometimes I know I want to be more direct and, and it's not a lack of commitment or desire. It's a lack of skill. <laughs> and uh, I know I'm very high context. And when I catch myself just going on, and I, let's land your idea. Stop saying what you want to say, right? So, but I have had to develop that because I didn't learn it in school. Mm -hmm. And I think we're a culture where there's not a lot of emphasis in learning to have assertive, objective, 
communication, make your point. Cantinflas is our hero. I don't know many, many of you know who Cantinflas is, but uh, Cantinflas was a comedian in, in Mexico, well, Maria, the year 60s, yeah. the 70s, 50s, 50s, 50s or 60s. Even yes. earlier, like, yeah, 50s and 60s. Yes. He was like our Charlie Chaplin. You know, okay. a lot of movies, very funny comedian. Uh, we love Cantinflas, but he has he had this main characteristic of having a really indirect, high context. He's not saying anything, but keeps talking, right? And and we love him. And from Cantinflas, there's a Mexican word, and all Mexicans know what what that means. And it's a verb. It's Cantinflas. You uh -huh. look for cantinflar in the dictionary, it means to talk a lot and not say anything. I see. So it's a verb. <laughs> it's not like I'm going to be, uh, I'm going to cantinflar, but you can really notice that it's something that it's very much in the Mexican communication. Huh. Interesting. Whether it's because we don't want to offend or it's because we don't have the skills uh, developed in our educational system to be assertive or uh, we don't, we are caring for the religion, whatever, but it's it's a verb in Mexico, so I'm it, learn a new word now. <laughs> new, new word, yes. So, but I think all of this is just to just like for me when when I started thinking about this, why is it that for people in the U.S. it's so easy to take risks? And I thought, well, of course, because da, 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 it's, it's a country that was born from the idea of let's take a risk. And same thing, the other way around, right? If, if someone is trying to understand indirect communication from a country like Mexico, you look at the educational system, you look at uh, what's important for Mexicans, you find the connection between collectivism, uh, relationship. And I think that that will also help in that, uh, what you were asking a while ago, right? How do you develop the skill? I think that more than developing a skill, it's developing the understanding. And then with that perspective, you will be more able to, it's like, putting the glasses, the right glasses on, and then you all of a sudden see a lot of things that you were not seeing before. Hmm. One thing that I, as you are talking, and you mentioned a word that is extremely important, I think, in, in, in terms of reading between the lines, and that is hierarchy. Hmm. And how, how does hierarchy work? How does hierarchy work in reading between the line when you have, let's say, a boss, and I don't know, an employee, an entry level employee, as an example, how would that work? I mean, maybe it works in the advantage of the boss, but not so much the entry level employee, as an example. How is that expressed? Oh, I think that it's, it's still a constant, that it's still something that's going to influence both <laughs> roles, uh -huh. uh, that part of caring how you give a message because uh, there could be a negative uh, result either case, right? I, I, I Sometimes I share that story. Uh, we had someone working at, at home uh, and she had a brother living in the US, I think. And one month the phone bill came with all of these calls to the US and it was a big amount, right? Well. Had I been someone in the U.S., you address it directly. You say, this came up. This cannot happen. I'm going to ask you to please uh, uh, don't make calls from the house. If you need something, please ask me. Uh, but for me, and, and, and there's hierarchy there, right? It was that easy. I had to think, how am I going to address this? So it doesn't happen again. But in a way that she doesn't feel that she's losing so much face that tomorrow she won't be here to, to you know, she, she won't come back. And so it took me like half an hour to think, okay, I'm going to say this and then this and then this. And, and hopefully she won't feel so like, you know, oh my God, I, 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 I lost so much, so much face and, 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 and not come back. Uh, it worked, <laughs> thankfully. But um, uh, yes, I had to start like, uh, say, I can't remember, I can't, her name was uh, Sophia or something like that, right? Uh, the, the phone bill came. I could immediately see her face. She was like, uh, there were a couple of calls <laughs> to the U.S. I want to ask you, is there a problem? Is your brother okay? You know, like, I care about you. It's not like the, the money, the bill. 
um, no, 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 everything's fine. Okay. Uh, yeah. Well, my husband was a little upset. My husband, not me. <laughs> right. So my husband was a little upset, but we, you know, can fix this, um, uh, you know, in the, in the coming weeks, you know, um, and please let me know when you have to, to, uh, and that's a very indirect way of saying we're going to discount it from your salary in the following weeks. Right. <laughs> but I'm saying this softly. Uh, and if you, whenever you have to break a call uh, to, to the US, let me know that those were the Skype years where you could make phone calls through the computer. And you know, I mean, it did cost something, but it was minor. Uh, I can set up everything and you can call your husband, your husband. You can call your brother through the computer. Okay, thank you, thank you. And I was like, please come back tomorrow, please. And she came out. She, she came back the next the next day, right? So, again, maybe someone from a direct communication culture would be listening to me and saying, "Oh my God, why to get into so, so much trouble? Just say what you have to say." And that's yes, but that would damage the relationship, and I would lose someone that I I don't want to lose, right? So. Yeah. Uh, again, in hierarchy, it's not only one way you can, you have to also pay attention or, or you apply that all of this high context, careful relationship, uh, regardless, because it can have an impact regardless. Wow. Wow. Interesting. Why do I have to go through all this trauma just to deliver a message? Why can't it be so simple? <laughs> <laughs> I know. And it, it I, and I think it gets to the point where we really need to remember that in cultural characteristics, there's no yeah. right or wrong or good or bad, especially I think with time, with communication, where, where of course there's, there's very, a lot of advantages to one side, but uh, high concept communication does have a lot of advantages uh, yeah. when you're nurturing relationships, when you're sending that message, I care about you, you know, and that's a long-term relationship that yeah. you're caring for. When you need a little more detail, a little more context, right? And it's, and it's a form of communication that people are very used to and find, okay, I remember in a program, a Mexican participant defending high context communication. He said, when I am answering your question with a, an answer that's a little longer than what maybe you expected, you know, don't cut my answer. If you go like, ta -ta 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 -ta, yes or no. It's like, if I caught you at the mid at middle of no, and I didn't let you finish your no, and you were left in, <laughs> You know, that's not nice. That's my answer. Listen to my answer. <laughs> and and it was a German participant because it was a multicultural group that raised a hand and he said he, he was like, uh, you know, uh, uh, an eye opener for him. He was like, you know what? Thank you. Thank you for because I am that person that says yes or no. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, and now and I had never thought how that might feel. You know, I uh -huh. thought you didn't you, you didn't know the answer or you didn't want to answer. However, if you think on my side, I'm expecting the short answer. So when you start with the story about, oh, well, there's going to be a meeting and maybe in that meeting, they'll rather than, yes, this is going to happen or not, it's not going to happen. Again, I think that either you didn't understand the question or you don't, you don't want to answer. So that's why I cut you and he shared a good strategy. So why not? That would be a suggestion for the high context to be a little more clear. Why not? Instead of going like, oh, I don't know. Can this happen tomorrow? Yes or no? Oh, la, 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 la. So yes. Why don't you just invert the order and say, you know, yes, here's why. And then, you know, I, I have my short answer and I have the patience and the openness to listen to, you know, the, the explanation and the context, et cetera. So yeah, I thought that that was, I mean, again, that's, that's a, a suggestion for the high context side. But also, I, I always tell uh, uh, people that are more direct, feel free to also help the other person ground those ideas. You know, so if there's the la, 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 la. <laughs> okay, so you mean this? Yes, Again, high context. I don't want to, you know, sound rude, but just to be clear that I'm uh, understanding you. So you mean this? For me, it helps. It's like, oh, yes, thank you. And then, okay, move, go on, <laughs> right? So just to check for understanding. Uh, that's another way to kind of like balance, I think, and not, again, I have to hear, listen to all of this and I'm already lost, but just to, and interruptions, take the, take advantage of the fact that interruptions are okay in many high context communication cultures. It's okay to interrupt. 
Now, wonderful. Um, our time for reading between the line is up. We enjoy the conversation and the topic is fascinating. Sometimes we really don't think about it, but it's so crucial, especially today, being in globalized world and also being conscious of time as well. We have to exercise patience. We have to understand the other. And there's so many things that we have to be aware of and cognizant about in in order for us to succeed in our interaction. Maria, final say for this session. Remember that it's not just the words, it's the, the tone and the nonverbal. That'll help you pick up on what's actually being said when you're trying to read between the lines. All right, excellent. With that, thank you so much to our guest who took from her time to be with us and say hello to our folks out there in Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> I will. <laughs> And uh, thank you for the invaluable information that you shared with us. Until next time, stay well, stay safe, and be global. Thank you so much. Thank you.